The first modern cooperatives we think about things was formed in 1844, and they were off. They were called the Rochdale Pioneers. Prior to that, we had mutuals formed. So, for example, Ben Franklin is widely recognized as having formed the first mutual insurance company um, in the 18th century in, in Philadelphia, which still exists today, by the way. We saw the model being used in early Great Britain at, in response partly to the Industrial Revolution. So people were worried about things like adulterated foods. Long before we had a Food and Drug Administration in the United States, people worried about things like what was the quality of the meat I was buying? What was the quality of the tallow? Because we didn't have electricity then, they were having to buy candles, and sometimes the candle burned very fast, and sometimes it burned very slow. People used lard for cooking. And so they wanted to know what was the quality of what they were doing. Were they, was it actually high quality food? Or was it in fact poor quality that people had cobbled together? And so we saw cooperatives being formed as a way to give consumers some reliability about the foods they were consuming and certain products that they were used. So prior to 1844, we had a, several cooperatives formed in Great Britain. They didn't survive. But they did learn about the different, what we think about as the principles of cooperation, things that were working, things that were not working, didn't work, was used then in the formation of Rochdale, which was the first widely known cooperative society as we know it. This was called the Rochdale Equitable Pioneer Society, and they were formed on Toad Lane. There's a book in the reading list that talks, that's publicly available, that talks about the formation of the Rochdale Society and what it went through as it was first formed. So this cooperative is very interesting if you look at it. Sugar, tallow, butter, products that consumers need, products that were used every day, products that were used in baking, and that were very important for a consumer and their family were the things that they stocked. After the, the first couple of years, the model started taking off and they formed a wholesaling cooperative. So in order to supply themselves those products and have some knowledge over these products, they said, we've got to form a company to go out and buy those products in large volume, pass the volume discounts back to each of the cooperatives, and those volume discounts then were available to the members. So that's where we saw, the, the in terms of consumer cooperative, that's where we saw this simple economic model of buying things in bulk or volume and passing along the volume discounts back to consumers. The reverse is true for an agricultural cooperative where agricultural producers will produce things in bulk like milk or almonds and then get volume premiums from the marketplace for that volume of purchasing. It's also why if you think about school districts, prisons, restaurants, and so forth, oftentimes they've got large purchasing cooperatives that they're members of. They buy things like toilet paper, other paper products, paper plates, cutlery, um, napkins, um, large uh, bulk um, canned products, for example. By merging 7, 9, 10, 15, 20 school districts together, they can get all those benefits of buying in bulk and pass along those volume discounts back to their member cooperatives. So those are some of the unique things about the Rochdale Equitable, Equitable Pioneers when they were first formed. So they had a very interesting model when they first started, similar to what we think of today as how worker cooperatives might be formed. Consumers did business with a cooperative, and the co-op deducted from their transaction a certain um, dollar amount to be used for um, helping finance the cooperative. So, for example, a case, say something simple like a $5 membership fee. Not every member had $5 to contribute on day one to the cooperative. So they allowed the members to earn their way into the cooperative, if you will, for their membership fee. And that type of concept is, is sometimes used by cooperatives today with regard to the membership fee. They also had consumers who were able to contribute the full amount of the membership fee on day one. And so they paid on day one as opposed to earning their way into the cooperative over time. So every quarter then, the cooperative would figure out what its uh, cost of sales was and what its sales were for the total year and come up with a net income or net savings. At the end of the year, Whatever local savings was left after they had paid all their costs, looked at reinvestment for the future, um, it was all given based back on proportionality. If you were to look at the seven principles of cooperation, all seven basically came from the Rochdale pioneers. 
Over time, they put together a library. That library had books and information about cooperation. They could invest in their community. If you look at the geographical boundaries of the Rochdale Cooperative, it was very firmly set into uh, urban England. So they were formed in 1844. The principles that we know today all came from the Rochdale Pioneers.